the 20th of November, 1945, one of the most important court cases in history opened in Nuremberg, Germany. In the dock were almost 200 high-ranking Nazi officials. Amongst them, all smiles, Hermann Goering, number two of the regime. The trial was highly symbolic and lasted over a year. Cameras from all over the world were there to record the event. The trial of the century gathers momentum. Though missing from the 21 prisoners in the dock and unnamed in the indictment, the evil genius of Adolf Hitler is here on trial. The top Nazis' own words and actions rebound in their faces to damn them for their crimes. The indictments against them reflected the gravity of the atrocities they had committed. The term crime against humanity was used for the first time in a court of law. Of the 200 accused, 37 of them were sentenced to death by hanging and executed in the days that followed. While justice may have been served on these high-ranking officials, the truth is that there should have been many more with them in the dock. In this document, the Allies identified Nazi war criminals. They are listed individually in the hundreds of pages, and the list extends to over 30,000 names. for example, wanted uh, army personnel, anyone that was wanted for war crimes, crimes against Allied soldiers and against Jews, for example, uh, they would be on this list. Amongst all these names, some of them still resonate today. Names such as Adolf Eichmann, the man in charge of the death camps. Dr. Joseph Mengele, head physician at Auschwitz, who conducted medical experiments on deportees. There was also Klaus Barbie, nicknamed the Butcher of Lyon, head of the Gestapo and responsible for arresting and deporting hundreds of Jews. 30,000 Nazis were on the list, each of whom had been assigned to Mauthausen, Dachau, or Auschwitz concentration camps. Of the crimes they were accused of, murder and torture are the most recurrent. The reason why most of them were absent from the various trials set up by the Allies was that these criminals only had one objective, to escape from justice. To achieve this, many Nazis resorted to organized networks. Some were secretly helped by official institutions, and others were aided by accomplices above all suspicion. There are about 150,000 people who committed war crimes during the Third Reich, of whom only 50,000 were ever apprehended. So what happened to the other 100,000? They didn't all just disappear. There was, in fact, an organized escape network. The technical term is a rat line. And they escaped prosecution. Highly sophisticated networks enabled thousands of Nazis to get far away. Although their escapes sometimes took them to the other side of the world, they usually started in the heart of the German countryside. In the summer of 1945, in a farm in the north of the country like this, a farmer was enjoying a peaceful existence. Everybody knew him as Friedrich Neumann. But contrary to appearances, this man was no simple peasant. That was just a smokescreen. History Hit is an award-winning streaming platform built by history fans for history fans. Our goal is to bring you award-winning documentaries that cover the events and figures that have shaped our world all in one place. Travel with us to the fascinating world of prehistoric Scotland or uncover the lives of the people who called Pompeii home. We also aim to bring you the stories and legends that shaped our world through our award-winning podcast network. Sign up now for a free trial and Timeline fans get 50% 
20% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code TIMELINE at checkout. This farmer was really an SS officer. His real name was Ludolf von Alvensleben, a police chief in Ukraine. With the blood of nearly 5,000 civilian gunshot victims on his hands, all Jews and gypsies. Indeed, his name appears on the infamous list of war criminals. He was one of the most wanted Nazis on the run. Von Abensleben's career during the war as, as a, a higher um, security SS and, and, and police uh, uh, commander, and also as adjutant to Himmler, uh, makes him in many ways kind of Nazi aristocracy. He's also from a very aristocratic family, but he also, as a Nazi, he's a very senior Nazi. Um, he is therefore an extremely important figure. 90% of war criminals went into hiding in the countryside at the time, often remaining incognito in their own country, never to be caught, and sometimes even going on to lead a peaceful life. However, they sometimes had to change their plan. This is what happened to Ludolf von Alvensleben. On the 2nd of August, 1946, Ludolf had some unexpected visitors. A jeep arrived at his home with two investigators, wanting to ask him a few questions. For some months, hundreds of Allied soldiers had been combing even the most remote areas of the country, going from door to door, at checkpoints. Everybody was searched and arrested on the slightest suspicion. Indeed, Ludolf von Alfensleben aroused the suspicions of the investigators because his behavior was very much in contrast with his answers. He also looked more like an aristocrat than a simple peasant. There was something about his bearing, something about the way he spoke. There was something about his very easy manner, a very confident manner talking to me that made me realize that this man wasn't this kind of very low-born person. He was something much more, and that aroused his suspicions. The investigator even suspected he might be rather high-ranking. Therefore, the order was given for him to be watched closely. Von Alvensleben's smokescreen could have ended there and then. However, it had only just started. Said to his colleagues, make sure the guards put him in solitary isolation. Uh, Dennis had his suspicions about von Alvensleben. And unfortunately, when uh, Dennis came back from compassionate leave, the first thing his colleagues said was, oh, von Alvensleben's gone. The prisoner got away. Taking advantage of a hastily set up camp, he pretended to be an injured patient in an ambulance on its way to the hospital. However, von Alvensleben knew that his cover had been blown and that he had to leave Germany quickly. He was on the run for ages and blended into the millions of refugees roaming around the country. In the chaos of Europe, in the rubble, the mess, all these people running around. It's very easy to disguise yourself as somebody and hide. It really helps wanted Nazis. But where could he run to exactly? The fleeing Nazis knew that they would run into a dead end any direction they went. Germany was completely surrounded. To the north was the sea. In the east, the Soviets were carrying out summary executions and the Allies had mass troops in the West. Therefore, the only way to head was for a small gap in the south, 150 kilometers from the border. Tucked away in the Alps, between Austria and Italy, is a peaceful region where the Nazis could take refuge and even gain a passage to escape from the Allies. The area is called South Tyrol. It's a small region, which enjoyed a very special statute at the time.
The borders of Europe were still being redrawn at the time, and the Allies had not yet decided what to do with it. Therefore, the inhabitants of South Tyrol didn't yet have a nationality. They had the status of stateless persons. It was an administrative anomaly that only lasted a few months, but many Nazis, including, for example, von Albenschleben, took advantage of this. He was warmly welcomed when he arrived there because many Tyrolians spoke German and had never hidden their sympathy for the Hitler regime. Not too many questions are asked. You're going to find a lot of people there who are going to help you. You need somewhere to stay? Yes, yeah, stay in Bolzano. He, or you can stay up in the hills. Yes, it's, it's a really, really uh, hospitable place for a Nazi looking for somewhere to stay. The local administration was also very accommodating. They were quite happy to issue new identity documents, a completely new cover for fleeing Nazis. This is how Ludolf von Alfenschleben eventually became Kremhardt Theodoro. He even invented a new past for himself. He was now of Italian origin. His father was also called Theodoro and his mother, Anna. He'd assumed a completely new identity, and most importantly, the former SS officer now benefited from the status of stateless person. This was important because it meant that he could now easily obtain a travel document, in other words, a sort of passport to leave Europe. South Tyrol was an important region for a lot of those people. There were some bureaucratic administrative possibilities, perhaps to get an identification paper uh, or a travel document, something like this, to go on with the escape route. To obtain the famous passport, the Nazis resorted to a formidably efficient network of collaborators headed by highly placed people normally considered to be beyond any suspicion. Rome, just after the war. Italy was one of the first countries to be freed by the Allies. Italy was just getting over fascism, and yet at the heart of its capital, there was an institution that Nazis would still turn to. Although some of its members were anti-Nazi, other members of the institution aided war criminals to flee. The institution in question was the Catholic Church. Because within the Vatican itself, some senior church leaders were devoted to more than just the church. Archbishop Alois Hudal, for example. Of Austrian origin, Monsignor Hudal was also a great sympathizer of the Nazi regime. It was widely known that he was the most sympathetic man to the Nazis inside the Vatican. Before the war, Alois Hudal wrote a book, the title of which clearly states his convictions, The Foundations of National Socialism. The book aims to reconcile Catholicism with Nazism. He even sent Adolf Hitler a copy with a handwritten dedication praising him as the new Siegfried of Germany's greatness. Comparing the Führer to the famous mythological invincible warrior prince. He was himself a, a gold party member and uh, an ardent supporter of the Third Reich. He drove around Rome with a, a greater Reich flag on his car. Well, at least until the Allies came in. And as the Reich was falling, Alois Hudal used all his powers to help Nazi fugitives. He got them formal passports, which helped them get away. Alois Hudal used the Vatican's name and Holy See resources to help fleeing Nazis, as this document we obtained proves. It's a letter written by the Papal Commission bearing the Vatican coat of arms in the header. It's dated 26th of July, 1948. 
and is clearly asking for a passport to be kindly issued to the applicant Otto Pape of stateless person status. The request is addressed to the International Red Cross. Although this may appear surprising today, at the time, Europe was in such a state of chaos that the Humanitarian Association was given the task of issuing passports to refugees wishing to emigrate. However, before issuing the precious documents, the Red Cross imposed a number of conditions. You had to be a stateless refugee and provide either a witness to confirm the identity of the applicant or moral support. What could be better than a letter like this with the support of the Vatican, represented by a bishop such as Alois Hudal? That was an absolute guarantee of getting a passport. The head of the local Red Cross uh, said that she would normally give Hudal whatever he asked for. He was a bishop of the church. Of course, she's going to believe the priest, and he would tell her whose name to put in, what date to sign it, and she did. She thought nothing more of it. Indeed, the following day, the Red Cross issued a passport in the name of the applicant Otto Pape. However, this Otto Pape, with his well-groomed moustache, was a refugee like no other. He was the most wanted Nazi officer in Italy. His real name was Erich Priebke, SS captain, Gestapo officer in Rome. He was accused of killing 35 Italians with a bullet to the head. Hundreds of innocent Roman citizens, some as young as 14 years old, were taken out to a cave and executed by Pribke. And it was Pribke who directed that. And he was one of the most wanted war criminals in the history of Rome. Yet it was from here, Rome, that Erich Priebke was able to slink away, to leave the continent and get well away from prosecution. And this was only possible thanks to the network headed by Alois Udal. And he was not the only Nazi that the bishop helped. There were dozens more, including some of the most wanted men in Europe, such as Adolf Eichmann, Dr. Mengele, and Klaus Barbie. One thing is certain, in June 1947, a report classified as top secret revealed the existence of this high-level network. The report belonged to the American US administration. The inquiry had been conducted by the American Secret Service and its contents proved to be a bombshell. It was entitled, Clandestine Immigration Movements in Italy. The over 30 page report detailed how emigres had left Italy illegally and fingers were pointing firmly at Nazi Germans. There has been and still are large groups of Nazi Germans who come into Italy for the sole purpose of obtaining fictitious identity documents, passports and visas. The report also highlighted the role played by the network of helpers who facilitated the escape of the fugitives. Number one on this list was the Vatican. The Vatican, of course, is the largest single organization involved in the illegal movement of emigrants. The report also detailed the role played by the Vatican in the exfiltration of the Nazis. But further investigation indicated that in those Latin American countries where the church is a controlling or dominating factor, the Vatican has brought pressure to bear which has resulted in the foreign missions of those countries taking an attitude almost favoring the entry into their country of former Nazis and former fascists. The report gives a detailed list of 22 contacts within the Vatican involved in aiding Nazis, amongst others, to flee from Europe. Many of those contacts bear the title of Monsignor, in other words, bishops. Top of the list was Monsignor Udal. His address and telephone number are also given. Did this American report reach the upper echelons of the Vatican? 
Was the then Pope, Pius XII, aware of it? We will never know, because the Vatican still refuses to declassify its archives. However, many experts believe it is extremely possible. On n'imagine pas qu'un rapport de cette importance n'arrive pas sur le bureau du pape. Quand on dit le bureau du pape, c'est vraiment le bureau du pape, car Pidouze, à cette époque-là, n'a pas de secrétaire d'État. En temps normal, ces rapports arrivent sur le bureau du secrétaire d'État, c'est-à-dire du premier ministre du Vatican. Là, justement, à cette époque, il n'y a pas de secrétaire d'État. Donc le rapport arrive exactement sur le bureau du pape. And if the Pope was indeed aware of his bishop's actions, one thing is certain, he did nothing to stop him. It must be said that the head of the Catholic Church was never vehemently against the Nazis and the support given to them. Indeed, during the war, he made a rather ambiguous speech. Whilst the Allies had just publicly denounced the massacre of the Jews, Pope Pius XII, on the other hand, remained rather low-key about the whole affair. In an endless speech lasting over one hour, the Jewish question was relegated to just two lines, and he didn't even mention them by name. He simply stated, and I quote, hundreds of thousands of people who, through no fault of their own, and sometimes due simply to their nationality or race, were doomed to die or to inevitable extermination. Il n'y a pas eu cette phrase forte du pape. Le seul fait de ne pas avoir employé le mot juif. Alors il emploie le mot race, mais il n'emploie pas le mot juif. Eh bien, ça laisse un doute et ça laisse effectivement une espèce de regret pour tout le monde, pour les juifs, mais aussi pour les catholiques qui aimeraient tant que leur pape ait prononcé les mots qu'il fallait à l'époque. The pope's ambiguity lingered for several years. One explanation for the church's attitude at the time was that the church was worried about a threat that it considered even more dangerous than the Nazis, the communists, the declared enemies of all religions. That time, 40, 46, 47, Italy perhaps was going communist uh, by election. So this was a very difficult situation. The atheist communism could gain political power in Italy. This was the worst case situation for the Catholic Church. What to do? Be it for political or ideological reasons, hundreds of Nazis were able to obtain a passport and flee from the Allies, thanks to accomplices in the Church. Once they had this precious document to hand, some of these fugitive criminals were able to find refuge. It was a state that did all it could to protect these fleeing Nazis from the clutches of the Allies. Hundreds of them, such as Priebke, Klaus Barbie, and Eichmann, were welcome. This state lies 12,000 kilometers away from Italy, on the other side of the Atlantic. It is Argentina. In Argentina, you could feel at home. You just need to go into any school to understand why. In the heart of South America, you will find entire classes of blonde little heads, because since the 19th century, Argentina has been a popular immigration destination for Germans. By 1945, there were already approximately 240,000 Germans there. They were attracted by the booming economy of the country. And some of them were sympathizers of the Third Reich. Some even went as far as turning Hitler into an idol. Therefore, it was the ideal country for Nazi criminals to hide in. So much so that even the most powerful man in the country, the Argentinian president himself, offered them hospitality and protection. Juan Perón was a dictator with an iron hand who had long held sympathies for European fascist regimes. He admired Mussolini and he tried to copy some of the fascist state for Argentina. Not the aggressive elements, but the social elements. He 
admired Germany as a cultural nature. He admired uh, German military. Indeed, it is the German army's expertise that von Perron craved, because he had an obsession. He wanted to modernize both his country and his army by every means possible. So he didn't hesitate to welcome thousands of fleeing Germans on his soil, including many Nazis. Perron wanted Nazis because he thought that many of them had the kind of technical know-how that would enable him to develop new weaponry and new forms of industry. So Juan Perón put in place a very efficient system to exfiltrate Nazis from Europe from under the nose of the Allies. It all took place at two Argentinian consulates in Bern, Switzerland, and Genoa, Italy. Fugitive Nazis only had to present a false passport, like those issued with the complicity of the church, for Argentina to quickly grant them a formal visa. This was a state-sponsored enterprise to get these people out. This wasn't just some uh, freelance criminal enterprise. You know, this was governmental policy and to get Nazis across the Atlantic. Thanks to networks like these, over 5,000 Nazis were able to emigrate to Argentina. On their arrival, they were able to start a new life with the protection of President Perón. However, some of them would eventually have to account for their crimes such as Adolf Eichmann, who, 10 years after his arrival in Argentina, was kidnapped by the Israeli secret services in 1960 and then judged and condemned to death by hanging in Israel. Or Erich Priebke, who lived for nearly 50 years as a headmaster before being extradited by Italy and condemned in 1998 to life in prison. But such cases are still rare. Most Nazi criminals hiding in Argentina lived a quiet life for the rest of their days without ever having to face trial. One such person was von Alvensleben, who reinvented himself as a fish farmer. He died unpunished at the age of 69. On February the 4th, 1945, on the banks of the Black Sea, in the small Soviet spa town of Yalta, a very high-ranking meeting was about to begin. It was a meeting that was to decide the future of the world. Present at the meeting were British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, the President of the United States, Franklin Roosevelt, and the Soviet leader, Joseph Stalin. They were meeting on that day because they knew that victory was at hand. Indeed, German troops had suffered heavy defeats on all fronts. In the east, Stalin's troops were knocking on the door of Berlin. In the west, the Allies were advancing into France and were about to invade Germany. The fall of the Third Reich was only a question of weeks. The three future superpowers had already made up their mind to occupy Germany. All that remained was to share the cake. On a tracé sur la carte de l'Europe des zones d'occupation confiées aux Soviétiques, aux Américains, aux Britanniques et même aux Français. On est dans un changement de données géopolitiques. However, behind the smiles, a different battle was being fought in the wings between the three men. What we often forget is that the leaders of the Allies meeting in Yalta had their eyes on much more than just the territories of defeated Germany. Each one of them wanted to lay their hands on the best kept secret of the Reich. A secret that would give the person who could lay his hands on it unparalleled power, a technological treasure. Because since the start of the conflict, the Nazi regime had been investing colossal sums in high-tech scientific research. They were planning to make revolutionary weapons, 
powerful, destructive weapons that would make them invincible. C'est la technologie des chars, c'est la technologie des sous-marins, euh, c'est bien sûr euh, l'éventuel programme atomique euh, allemand dont on ne sait pas grand-chose. One of these weapons was of particular interest to the Allies. It was a formidable weapon that only the Germans had been able to develop. A weapon that the Americans, the English and the Russians alike wanted to lay their hands on at all costs because it would give the person who got this technology such a decisive advantage for years to come. The first time the Allies got wind of the existence of this revolutionary weapon was two years before the end of the war. What's most surprising is that the information came from the Germans themselves. In 1943, in the English countryside on the outskirts of London, lay a place called Trent Park. Although this beautiful looking manor house looked no more than a holiday retreat, it was actually one of the best kept prisons in England. It housed some extremely precious war prisoners of the British Army, German generals captured on the front line. For the capture of German generals in, in North Africa and Italy, they were brought to one special site, to Trent Park. The least you could say about this VIP prison was that its inmates were treated like kings. Inside the house, they could walk anywhere. Uh, they had use of dining room. They had their own bedrooms to start with. And they just thought they were running the place themselves. And they began to talk to each other, not just about the English weather. However, what the German generals didn't know was that the British hospitality was just a ploy. On the other side of the walls of the house, the British secret services were listening in on all their conversations. The entire house was bugged. Everything the German generals said was recorded, transcribed, and analyzed. The aim was to glean strategic information from them without their knowing. We were allowed access to British Secret Service archives, and this is what one conversation on the 26th of May 1943 revealed. For the first time, three generals mentioned the existence of a whole new weapon a flying bomb with unprecedented features. Things look very bad for our Air Force. I wonder how far they've got with the rockets. I saw the one we developed some time ago and was present at the first tests. It had a range of between 150 and 200 kilometers. Flying bombs with a range of 200 kilometers. British spies had never heard of anything like these weapons. They couldn't believe what they were hearing. Their bosses wondered whether it was fiction. And they very quickly realized, no, this is for real. Something has been developed. It's incredibly deadly. And it was also commented this was going to win the war for Germany. Now, this is serious. During this conversation, the British soon realized that these flying bombs could pose a threat to Britain itself. Why don't we put these rockets on the French coast and fire them towards England? The thought sent a chill down the spines of the British. If these arms could reach the center of London, they had to be found and neutralized as soon as possible. This became top priority for British intelligence. Le rôle des services secrets, c'est de vérifier, de croiser. Ils vont utiliser pour cela euh, l'analyse des documents. Ils vont utiliser les interrogatoires de prisonniers de guerre. On met des micros cachés euh, pour tenter de voir ce qui se passe. Et ensuite, on va aller vérifier sur place. Et il y a un moyen pour vérifier sur place, c'est d'envoyer des missions de photographie de reconnaissance spécialisées. The Royal Air Force had hundreds of reconnaissance planes that flew over and photographed the German territory on a regular basis. 
During one of these missions, British pilots stumbled upon a German military site that appeared to be harboring some very unconventional weapons. In the northern tip of Germany, near the Baltic Sea, the spy planes took some surprising pictures over an area extending several kilometers called Pienemunde. From the sky, it was difficult to decipher what they could see. But the British experts did find some precious clues. Towards the north of the site, there was a very tall building that they identified as a control tower. A few meters away, several vertical structures that could only have been launch pads. However, more ominously, to the west lay a strange elongated metal machine. A sort of elongated wingless plane. Au mois de juin 1943, ils identifient sur des clichés de Penamun un objet totalement nouveau, et cet objet, c'est clairement une fusée. A rocket of this type. A futuristic missile. Such a huge rocket that had never before been seen on a battlefield in the 40s. The information was immediately sent to the highest level of office in London. And once he'd been informed, the British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, took a radical decision. On the 17th and 18th of August, 1943, about 500 British planes crossed the channel to bomb the base in Pinamunda. The attack was intense, and the British thought they had destroyed all the rockets, but they were mistaken. The fierce attack had only destroyed part of the site, and the British were about to pay dearly for that. On the 13th of June, 1944, London was buzzing. A few days earlier, the Allies had managed to land on the beaches of Normandy. For the British, the war had taken a new turn. Their morale was high when, out of the blue, the skies were rent with a strange sound over the city. Fast-flying missiles charged with explosives. These arms ont en fait euh, heurté Londres d'une façon très douloureuse parce que elles arrivaient de nulle part. On pouvait pas se préparer. The missiles fell on the capital ceaselessly for several weeks. The carnage they left behind was immense. Londoners had to flee the capital. Over a million people sought refuge in the countryside. Schools, hospitals, churches, nothing and no one was spared. The British anti-aircraft batteries would sometimes be able to intercept them, but that would prove totally ineffective when a whole new generation of German rockets replaced them a few months later. From September 1944, the Germans deployed the faster and more deadly V-2 rocket. The fusée V-2 is an object revolutionary in the sense of the etymological term. It is a technological extraordinary that allows to send an object at long range, at very high speed, so without the capacity for the adversary to intercept it. Over 1,000 missiles of this kind fell on London within eight months. And the V-2 rockets also targeted Allied forces on the continent, especially in Normandy, near Paris, and Belgium. The enemies of the Reich had never been up against such advanced technology before. So whilst the fall of the Nazis seemed at hand, each ally set itself a new objective, to be the first to lay their hands on Hitler's rockets. In the east, the Russians entrusted one of these missions to Sergei Korolev, one of the most reputable engineers in the Soviet Union and an expert in weaponry. 
In France, General de Gaulle gave free reign to the head of the police laboratory in Paris, Henri Moureux, who had studied the V-2 rockets closely. But way ahead on this project were the British and the Americans. The latter put the mission in the hands of a military engineer, Major Staver. L'US Army a envoyé sur le continent européen, à la suite de l'armée américaine, une mission spéciale qui est dirigée par le Major Staver, qui a une solide formation d'ingénieur, pour mettre la main sur les éléments clés du programme V2, mettre la main sur des ingénieurs, mettre la main sur des archives, mettre la main sur des fusées V2 intactes. Major Staver started his investigations in February 1945 in London. He studied intelligence services files, looking for one piece of information, the name of the German engineer responsible for the V2 rocket. And it was from one of the conversations recorded between the generals at Trent Park that he found what he was looking for. In a conversation dated 10th of June, 1944, the generals referred to a scientist who was apparently responsible for the rocket program. Dr. Von Braun, a very talented engineer, has been responsible for the development of this whole affair. Then we needed rockets to develop tank-destroying bombs. When the prisoners, and particularly the German generals, start talking about the secret weapons, uh, the V1, V2, and especially with the discovery of Von Braun, this is all shared with the Americans. In this footage of Werner von Braun, taken in 1943, he was only 31 at the time, but already the director of the secret base in Pinamunda. This amiable-looking young man owed his entire career to the Nazi regime. Von Braun is seen proudly posing here in this photo, taken in 1934, during his initial rocket tests. Amongst the guests of honor that day was Adolf Hitler. The Führer had been struck by the engineer's charm. It was he who had asked him to take charge of the secret flying bombs project. And the ambitious von Braun didn't have to be asked twice before accepting. Werner von Braun is a person who has no scrupule. Tout is good to atteindre the fixed fixé. The fin justifies the moyens. Tout is good, y compris the regime nazi. He adheres to the party nazi. En 40, il devient membre de la SS parce que pour euh, les dirigeants de l'intelligentsia du Troisième Reich, c'est un facteur de croissance de carrière. From June 1942, von Braun started developing his missile program and launched his first rockets. Initial tests proved catastrophic. The V1s even exploded before liftoff. It would take five months of tests for Von Braun to get his rockets to fly. Production was rolled out at the Pinamunda site in late 1942. Hundreds of V1 and V2 rockets left this factory until, a few months later, the site was partially destroyed by the British. The Nazis realized that the site had been discovered and so decided to move the factory elsewhere in Germany. Le seul moyen de protéger des productions vitales pour l'avenir du régime, c'est de les enterrer, de construire des usines souterraines qui se retrouveraient ainsi protégées des bombardements stratégiques alliés. Von Braun's team started looking for an underground site. The choice fell on a disused mine located 200 kilometers south of Hanover, right in the heart of Germany. The site was called Dora. Dora provided a network of deep underground tunnels, the ideal hiding place from British reconnaissance planes. However, to rebuild the factory and make the rockets, von Braun would need laborers, thousands of laborers. So Dora became more than just a factory. It became a concentration camp. 
we met a survivor of the camp. His name is Christian de Sault. He's 89 years old. He was 17 when he was deported by train for resistance activities and found himself there, not knowing where he was. J'arrive là, je suis dans les premiers. C'est environ le 8 février 1944. On va entrer là. Il y a peine de la lumière. Ça hurle dedans. On entend des explosions. On entend une locomotive qui siffle. On marche sur des tas de trucs mous. On ne sait pas ce que c'est. C'est plein de cadavres. He was walking on heaps of bodies in this tunnel. They were deportees that had died on the job. Their job was to assemble Werner von Braun's rockets in a huge underground factory. On nous ouvre une porte et on passe de l'autre côté et qu'est-ce qu'on voit? Une usine, une usine, un truc immense, une fusée là sur sur les rails. Ça va où ça? Dans le ciel, ça va dans la, dans, dans la mer, mais on va mourir. On n'est pas mort au travail, mais on va mourir. Ils vont détruire le monde avec ça. Christian spent 13 months in that hell, working relentlessly, despite all the blows and hardships. He and his mates built over 200 rockets like this one until spring 1945, when the German army, in full retreat, was obliged to abandon the factory. The Americans landed on the 11th of April. The ruins of Dora turned out to be a massive grave. Two hundred deportees had died from exhaustion or been shot by the fleeing Germans. The entire site was searched. And when they realized that it was the V-2 rockets that were being built here, the GIs immediately informed Major Staver, who had been waiting impatiently for such a discovery. For the troops operational, it's the discovery of the horror concentration, but for the troops specialized who follow, the objective is not there. The objective is to recover the fusées and to recover the engineers. The problem was that Dora lay in the area apportioned to the Soviets by the Allies, and in a question of weeks, the site would be under Russian control. In no way was Major Staver going to let Stalin's troops lay their hands on this technology. So within a few days, Staver ordered the factory to be completely ransacked. Right under the noses of other Allies, he had the hundreds of V-2 rockets evacuated by train and then shipped to the US. However, that was not the end of the Major's mission, because the brain behind the rockets, Dr. Von Braun, had got away. How was he going to find him? The Russians and French were certainly also looking for him. What the Allies didn't know was that the German engineer had already planned everything. He now held all the aces. April 1945, near the town of Reuter in the Bavarian Alps. In this isolated hideaway, inside this small chalet, a small group of men came to hide. At their head was Werner von Braun. The Nazi engineer had a plan. Since all the Allies wanted him, he would sell himself to the highest bidder. Qui est candidat? à la reprise, en quelque sorte, de l'équipe de Panamun. C'est les États-Unis. C'est une grande puissance qui a des moyens financiers considérables et qui offre vraisemblablement une porte de sortie pour l'équipe de Van Braun. So the engineers simply waited for the American troops to show up at their hideaway. And when a detachment of GIs moved into the region, Werner Van Braun and the scientists on his team came out of their chalet and gave themselves up without a fight. It was the 2nd of May, 1945. The Americans were jubilant. They were the first to lay hands on the most wanted scientist in Nazi Germany. 
Von Braun was paraded like a prized catch, a war trophy. But the man continued smiling because he knew he had nothing to fear. Indeed, the Nazi scientist and the American army had already started secret negotiations. Von Braun wanted his past to be wiped clean, and in exchange he would continue his work for the Americans. On voit que ce personnage peut être remarquablement utile pour l'avenir des États-Unis. Donc on va commencer à négocier les conditions du transfert outre-Atlantique de Van Brand et de son équipe. Two months later, the American administration gave its green light. Von Braun was secretly exfiltrated to the United States. C'est un sentiment d'admiration sans nul doute qui est en train d'émerger. Et un sentiment d'admiration, malgré le fait que les Américains sont tout à fait informés de l'appartenance de Van Brand au parti nazi, ils connaissent également le fait qu'il est membre de la SS, mais on ne s'arrête pas à ce genre de détails quand on tient un personnage de l'ampleur de Werner Van Brand. C'est le calcul qui est fait par les Américains. And it paid off because it brought the American scientific research a tremendous boost. Two, one, zero, all engine running. In the following years in the United States, Werner von Braun went on to have a brilliant career. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. In 1960, he became the very first director of the NASA Space Center. And nine years later, his work led to the launch of the Saturn V shuttle, the one that enabled man to walk on the moon for the first time. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Although he was the first German scientist to be exfiltrated to the United States, he was certainly not the last. From July 1945, the Americans put in place a massive operation code named Operation Paperclip. A total of over 1,600 German scientists ended up in American research laboratories. Some of them proven Nazis.